said, you know, when, when God said that the gospel had to be spread to the four corners of the earth, he didn't mean here in the sanctuary. But it's all good. It just it gives me an opportunity to look over that way and see her and Brother Ken and Brother Wade. And that's good. It's good to good to see you. Good to see all y'all over there. Good to see you. God bless you for holding down that side. Of the, they're equaling out the, the 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 building here for us. It's all good though. I'm just picking. But thank you again for coming out, and uh, we're gonna get started here for just a moment. Let me uh, remind you of a few things that we got going on for the remainder of the week. <clears throat> Some things that are taking place. Uh, the Autumn Leaves Festival. Uh, the seniors are going on this day trip Friday uh, at leaving the church, meeting the church here at 830. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out there if you're able to go. Uh, if you got any questions about that, you can ask Brother Jim, Sister Sue. They'll be able to tell you more about that. Our Laps for Life fundraiser is this Saturday uh, from 9 to 1. Uh, pray for favor with the weather. Uh, we just believe in God's going to give us favor with that. He did it last year, and we're just so thankful that he did that. But uh, it's going to be from 9 to 1 at Halls Grove Church on Car Farm Road. So uh, we'd encourage you to, if you can come out and be a part of that, there'll be hot dogs and uh, all kind of things for the kids and singing and worship and walking and all those good things. So I'd encourage you to come out for that. Uh, we've been told that the the uh, soup kitchen has been canceled for this Saturday. So uh, uh, if you were planning on being there for this Saturday, it's, it's not gonna, they're not going to be uh, doing that this Saturday. So if you had that in mind, please don't uh, forget about that. And then uh, this 17th of October, uh, we're trying to get together some uh, Christmas boxes for Samaritan's Purse. And our, our biker, biker guys will be taking that over. The motorcycle ministry will be taking those over to the library on the 17th. So if you can start helping get some things together, even if you can't get boxes together, if you want to uh, slip one of these, a little bit of money or something, say, hey, can you pick some stuff up? I'm sure they do that. Uh, these ladies love shopping with somebody else's money. Do it all the time, don't it, Brother Carmen? Brother Carmen says, I ain't saying a word. <laughs> so uh, don't forget about that. And then Christian Ministries Outreach Project we've got going on, trying to get some things together for uh, uh, some homeless folks, the homeless community here. Uh, we are uh, want to try to get them some gloves and hats and socks, things like that. If you can get some of those things and uh, get them to us by the 17th of October, we want to try to get those things turned in. So please uh, keep that in mind. We do have revival coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks. Uh, Adrian Franklin is going to be with us, the newly married Adrian Franklin, the the, the world-renowned Adrian Franklin, CNN, Fox News, Adrian, that Adrian Franklin, that, that guy that everybody's been talking about him and uh, Brooks' picture from back in the day when they were like a miniature bride and groom, and now they get married, and it made, the, it made all the national headlines. So uh, it's going to be good to have a celebrity with us. Amen. We'll, 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 we'll trump that up a little bit and embarrass him real good because he just seems like the kind of fella. But if you've not heard Adrian Franklin preach, that man is a preaching machine. And uh, – He's going to be with us through that week, that Sunday through Friday. So please let your family and friends know and uh, folks that want to be a part of that. Man, it's, it, last year when he came, it was just a, a dynamic outpouring of God, and we just thank God for that. Uh, so be much in prayer about the revival coming up, uh, and that starts a week from Sunday uh, with Adrian. So keep that in mind. And then there's the nursery ministry schedule. All right? We good? All right. Let's go to Lord in prayer. We've got a few things that we need to pray about and ask God to have his way, and then we'll get right into the word. Uh, I want to ask you to remember my, my friend Ray that uh, I've been working with for the past uh, 17 years. His wife, Terry, uh, she um, has had a bout with kidney cancer before and uh, was cleared of that. Uh, but she had done a, a test, and they found a spot on her lung and a spot on her spine. And uh, she has to go in, back in tomorrow for a more thorough test. Uh, they, they discovered in the process of doing this test that she broke a rib. And uh, so they're not real sure. What all was going on with Terry, so I told Ray that we would definitely be praying for her tonight. So remember, Terry, if you will, that God would touch her and minister her and give them peace through this situation because they've gone through this before. And uh, I, I talked to Ray, and you just hear it in his voice that he was uh, a little anxious about this uh, testing tomorrow. So remember her. She's got to go to the, the main Presbyterian Hospital in Charlotte and uh, go through a, 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 about a two-hour process. So remember her. Artie Smith, this is Terry Poston's brother. I uh, had prayer with Terry today on, over the telephone. Uh, Artie's in prison. But they have transported him to uh, a hospital, and she said they have not given her any clear information. She knows that he's had some heart trouble. Uh, her main thing was that she, he didn't know the Lord, and all they would tell her was is that uh, uh, they were taken to the hospital and it didn't look good. Uh, so remember uh, Artie Smith, uh, Terry Poston's brother, that God would touch her, uh, touch him, and minister to him. Most of all, that he would give his heart to the Lord. Uh, Rachel Kenninger, this is a 34-year-old that's in the hospice house, uh, praying for an easy transition for her and also for the kids, two and five years old, and her husband. Uh, so remember her, them. Also remember Cameron. Uh, I'm going to try to go see Cameron tomorrow night. 
uh, and hopefully he'll be home Friday. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he's been getting some evaluations done on his medicines and things like that. I talked to him the other day. I said, how you doing, cameraman? He said, neutral. <laughs> so uh, whatever neutral is. So uh, they say he's getting better. So remember him. I'm sure that he's ready to get out of that facility and get back home, try to get back to uh, his life. So remember him. Uh, overseer Jimmy Smith uh, broke his collarbone. Uh, speaking of him, I have a meeting scheduled with him for this coming Tuesday. So I'd a- like to ask you to uh, ask God to just uh, have his way in that meeting and that uh, everything will go well and uh, that the Lord will just move in that. Howard Hester, somebody mentioned something about him. Did, is he, did he, I, I hate to even say this, but I thought somebody told me he passed away. He didn't? Okay. Somebody was talking to me about him, and I was trying to remember what they told me. But continue to remember Howard Hester. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I was thinking about the uh, uh, Neil Matheson family. Uh, so I, might, I might be crossing them up here. Uh, Debbie and Tony, I did speak with Debbie and Tony this week, and uh, they've been fighting um, cold, been passing it back from one to the other, uh, congestion real bad. He, he told me that I need to go home and take the pins out of the voodoo doll where I've been putting the mojo on him. I said, I ain't got nothing to do with that, Tony. So uh, remember Tony and Debbie as they're recovering from whatever it is they got going on. What it was, you know, Tony's big into roots and natural things and stuff like that. And he was bragging to me the other day about not being sick for five years. I said, I wouldn't say that if I were you. And as soon as he said it, he got sick. And I told him, I said, I tried to tell you not to say that. He said, you put the mojo on me. I said, you did it to yourself, brother. You, you just opened yourself up. You never say, well, bless God, look at me. What I Just as soon as you say it, you know what's going to happen. So uh, remember Tony and Debbie, if you will. Uh, Terry McGinnis, continue to pray for him as he's dealing with the issue with his kidney. And uh, he's been battling some stomach uh, disorder and sickness through this process. So remember him, if you will. Uh, Emily Carpenter, a 12-year-old, has been having seizures. Uh, my Aunt Shelby will be having her procedure tomorrow. So I'd ask you to pray for her, if you will, and my Uncle R.M., who's continuing to uh, go through his treatments for cancer. Uh, Tony Ryan, uh, surgery recovery. He actually has surgery today. Uh, not really sure how he did, but continue to pray for him as he's recovering from his surgery. Uh, that God would touch and minister him. For those of you that are Church of God and been with the Church of God, you might remember an evangelist by the name of John Banks. Uh, John Banks passed away this week. Uh, he'd been battling uh, with some cancer and stuff. So remember uh, the Banks family, if you will. They're, they're going to be having his memorial service tomorrow uh, at Mount Holly Church of God. So uh, for those of you that have been connected with the Church of God for any length of time, you probably remember him. He was a state evangelist at one time, but he passed away this week, and uh, they'll be having his funeral service on uh, uh, tomorrow. So remember, remember that family, if you will. Amen. Anybody else? By the, with the hand. Oh. Mm-hmm. Probably the same nurse that several rest of us had. Is it Lincoln? You was it, you did it, Lincoln? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember his name, but she, Clark. That's it. That same one then. Okay, same nurse that reels everybody out. She's. She's, she's faithful to ask prayer for her husband. So I, I, we, yeah. All right. That was good. She, she'll have church with you during the, in the, in the waiting area if you, if you get her started. She's, she, she's good for that. Amen. So remember, remember Bill Clark, if you will. Barbara Matheson. Yeah, remember her. Okay. So remember the Matheson family that God will touch them minister in. Amen. Uh, we also, uh, I've got a confidential situation that I really can't share much about, but it has to do with a marriage. Uh, and and uh, the Lord, uh, we, we're, we're uh, beginning to see maybe the Lord doing some work here on, on one party. And uh, we're just praying the Lord would do his work. Uh, most of all, that, uh, that this person would uh, turn back to the Lord and give their heart to the Lord. So remember that, if you will, uh, that God would touch that situation and have his way in that situation. And I know God's able to do that. Uh, listen, as long as they're up and breathing, God can still save them. Amen? Amen. So we're just believing and trusting that God would have his way in that situation and God would just move in that. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. All right. All right. Amen. Let's pray together. Ask God to have his way. Ask God to bless this time of the word. And uh, we just believe for God to have his will. Father, we love you. Thank you so much. For the opportunity that you've given us to come into your house, God, we bless your holy name, God. You're such a good God. We can never never thank you enough, Lord, for how good you've been to us, how gracious and merciful you've been to us. We thank you tonight, God, that we get to come and dig in your word for a little bit, God, and just learn of you. Lord, we, we want to know you in a more 
intimate and more deeper fashion, God, than we've ever known you before, God. And, and the way that we can come to know you, God, is through your word. Your word reveals to us who you are. It, it, there's, there's deep truths, God, that are in that word, God, that, that, that uh, uh, reveal to us the person of who you are through your son, through the power of your spirit, God. Your, your word is life. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come tonight and dig in your word, God. We, there are promises in your word, God, that we stand on tonight because, uh, God, we don't just come and, and make these declarations of, of, of needs and petitions known in vain, God, for your word declares that if we'll make them known unto you, God, that you will hear, you will answer, and you will show us great mighty things, Lord. And we thank you for the promise of your word, and we lift every need and every request up before you, God. They have been publicly acknowledged here tonight, Father. And those things that we have acknowledged in faith and believe in, God, that you're the healer, the deliverer, the way maker, God, we just surrender them to you in the name of Jesus, God, that you would move in a mighty way. God, you're the God that heals cancer. You're the God that, that, that delivers from addictions, God. You're the God that saves from the guttermost, Lord. I thank you for that tonight, God. The promise of your word, the promise of your power and your spirit, God, that you've given unto us, Lord, we can surrender those things to you. And Father, I just ask you tonight that you would touch every heart and every life of every person that is here tonight, God. I pray that you would help us to dig deep into the place, God, that you've called us to go and, and to do the things, God, that you are, are, are laying before us, God, that we would do them without shame, God, that we would do them with, with understanding and, and, and a depth of purpose, God, to, to ignore acknowledge that you are our Father, you're our Lord, you're our provider, you're our Savior, our healer, our deliverer, God, that we acknowledge that not just in a private moment, God, in a public moment, God, for if we're ashamed of men before, before men, God, you'll be ashamed of us before our Father, and we, we don't want that, Lord. We want to stand boldly and proudly, especially in this last day, God, acknowledging and exhorting one another. Fathers, we come together. I pray, God, that you would strengthen us through the power of your Spirit and your Word. God, help us to do all we do tonight to do it for your glory. Touch me tonight, God. I don't want to just stand up here and go through uh, uh, scriptures and notes and, and, and just, uh, you know, I, I want to I speak what you're speaking. I, I want to declare, God, what you're declaring. I pray, God, that your will be done. Open the ear of every hearer tonight, whether they be in this building or they're watching online or they may watch it later. God, I don't know. But, God, this word will go forth, and it will not return void. It is your word. It's a promise of your word that it will go forth and serve the purpose where until you sin it, God. And I'm believing tonight that your will is going to be perfected in us. Father, we give you the praise for it. We give you the glory for it. We give you the honor for it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. We serve a good God. Amen, amen. We are continuing in the book of Ephesians, and, and, and we started last week in Ephesians chapter 5, and we talked a little bit about being imitators of God, uh, as, as it talks about in Ephesians 5. We're going to go through the first eight, uh, seven verses, rather. Uh, we're going to look at the first seven verses again uh, tonight, and, uh, but we're going to go a little, little further in, uh, talking about uh, making light of sin. If there's ever been a generation that has made light of sin, it's the generation that we live in right now. They, 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 you know, it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not evil like it used to be evil. It, it, it's good things now. And the Bible declares that in the last days there will be those that would call evil good and good evil. And, and, and so we're beginning to see that even now in, 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 our, in our political arena, in our social arena, in, our, spirit, uh, in our, our, our religious arena. We're beginning to see a lot of things that at one time were deadly wrong. Now it seems to be acceptable, even in the church. And that's the scary thing, the thing that scares me. And so we, we need to begin to understand what it is that God is calling us to do and the direction that he's calling us to go. But let's begin, Ephesians chapter 1, begin with verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, begin with verse 1 rather. It says, therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness unclean, and covetousness, let it not even be named among you as, it, as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of this, these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And again, I want to talk to you tonight about making light of sin. Making light of sin. There's, there's, if we talked about last week some different warnings and some different things and, and an exhortation to be imitators of God. And we, we, we kind of went in depth there, and I, I really don't have time to go back through all that uh, tonight. But th to understand that God is calling us, he, he, he formed us and fashioned us first and foremost in his image. We are created in the image of God. And so being created in the image of God, we have the capacity to know him, to, to, to live with him, to abide with him. And so he, he tells us, Paul exhorts us here to be an imitator of God 
God. We talked about a couple of things about God, and there are some things that we can imitate Him in, but there's some things that we cannot imitate Him in. There, there are the communicable attributes of God, and there's the, the incommunicable attributes of God. The communicable attributes of God are His grace and His mercy. They're things that God can communicate to us or God can pass along to us that we can pass along to others. We can love Him as Christ loved us. We can love others as Christ loved us. We can forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. So there are communicable attributes about God that we can pass along. But then there are those incommunicable things that, that, that God cannot pass along or that we cannot have, you know, such as His omniscience. He knows all things. We can't know that. He, he is omnipotent. He has all power. We do not have all power. He's omnipresent. He can be in all places at one time. He's not bound by time. He's not bound by place. And so these are attributes about God that we do not have or that do, we do not, uh, 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 that do not pertain to us. So there are incommunicable things about God. But what Paul is encouraging us here is that we are to imitate God. We are to love others even as Christ loved us. We are to forgive others as Christ forgave us. And so there, there is an acknowledgement here of what we are to do and how we are to do these things. And so Paul goes through these particular scriptures and he shows us how to be imitators, to walk in love as Christ loved us and given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling aroma. And we got into that a little bit last week. But now he begins to talk about sin. He begins to talk about the elements of sin because you've got to understand the, the, the people that he's talking to. These people in Ephesus are coming into Christianity from a dark world, a sinful world. A place where it was common to have a, a, an adulterous relationship. It was common to have mistresses. It was common to go to the temple, the temples that were erected to these false gods. Uh, uh, you know, and and they would go there, and there were temple prostitutes that were there. And so it was common for them. It was it was something that 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 that, that they were used to. And so for this person to come in here with this message of Christianity, now it's interrupting their their mode of living, if you will. It's interrupting how they lived, and, and so. So it was a strange message to them, but yet one that intrigued them. The Christian message literally revolutionized their life. It, it changed them and impacted them, and, and it just turned their life upside down. We're, we're getting in that place now in America, especially, where, where the things of God are not as common as they used to be. We're, getting, we're living in a day and age now. You know, one of our children's teachers come to me crying and weeping and said to me, said, Pastor, I, I just don't understand it. We've got kids here that don't even know the song Jesus loves loves me. And I, and, and I told her, I said, listen, this is a different generation we're dealing with. We're not, we're not dealing with a generation that, that come up uh, as we came up, you know, and, 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 and church was a common thing. And, and going to church was, I mean, we are so, if I can put it this way, so stinking busy that, that we just fit God in where we can fit him in, but we become so busy that he can't even fit our own schedule anymore. It, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing the things that we see in America today, in America, uh, in America that at one time it was one nation under God. It, at one time it was in God we trust. But now we, we've got so many agendas, so many political agendas, so many social agendas that are out there that are literally pushing God out. I, a matter of fact, I, I watched a video this week and, and we saw I saw two things that happened in that video that blew my mind. I, I, uh, the, the president of the United States was in a was at a, a LGBT rally, and at that rally, he said, "Gay rights trump religious liberty." Gay rights trump religious liberty. Now, again, I, I, I'm not talking politics here. I'm just saying, you know, I, I don't read anywhere in the Constitution that a homosexual has a right. Not, not to that kind of, I don't see it. You know, I, I understand that you've been given life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and we have certain inalienable rights that are given to us by our Creator, and, and there's an acknowledgement there of who God is, but this is the place that we've gotten to. The Pope on his visit here in America said, and this is a quote, he said that the Bible and the Quran are equal in, 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 their, in their validity. The Bible and the Quran are equal in their validity. He, he, he's basically saying the Quran, which acknowledges that Jesus was a great man, but he was not the Son of God, but, and the Bible tells us specifically in, in John that Jesus is the Son of God, and, and he's saying that these two polar opposite quotes can somehow be meshed together, and, and, and we can have this kind of religion. It, it's what some people are calling Chrislam. They, they, they are looking for us to be able to, and it's all about the setup of a one-world religion. It, it's coming. 
thing, folks. It was been prophesied that, that they're going to try to bring this thing together. They're working on the economy. They're working on the religious. They're trying to get out the people that they call intolerant. And, and I find it funny that they call us intolerant, but they're intolerant of us. I, I mean, can anybody ask that question? I, I mean, that's the question. And, and it's almost to the point that we're making light of sin. I made this statement a few weeks ago. You know, it, it blows my mind that somebody stood up for a religious right and got put in jail for five days. In America. You, you, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you would have never convinced me that, that somebody would have been thrown in jail for standing up for a biblical principle. I, but it's happening. And so we, we're seeing in, in society today, we're seeing where sin is actually being made light of. We're seeing in, in, in society where people are actually looking at sinful lifestyles. And listen, it, it, it's, it's on our billboards. It, it's on, in our commercials. It, it's, it's on our television. It, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't sit and watch television anymore without the remote in your hand so that you can make a quick change if you got to. I mean, it's, it's sad the day and age that we're living in, but people are making light of sin. And so he begins to talk about these things. He says, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Don't let it be named among you. Don't, don't let it be said. Don't, even, don't, even let it, don't, even, don't even talk about it. Don't even get into a place that you're talking about it. And, and, and this is what Paul's encouraged us to do. Look, look at this. He says these shameful sins are not even to be talked about. The Persians had a rule, and, and, and so Herodias tells us, by which it was not even allowed to speak such things as it was not allowed to do. If it's not allowed to do it, they said don't even talk about it. Why? Because it opens up the opportunity to joke about something or make a frequent subject of conversation is, in to, is to induce, introduce it to the mind and bring it nearer to the actual doing of it. I mean, if, if you're constantly talking about something, it brings intrigue to our flesh side. You know, when you speak about the things of God, it's going to build the spirit man. When you speak of the things of the flesh, it's going to bring intrigue to the flesh and it's going to bring, uh, breed in that fleshly nature, that carnal nature that we all have, that, that, that we've got to keep subjected under the Spirit and the power of the Word of God. We've got to make sure that we do what we've got to do to build up the spirit man and kill the flesh. And so we have to make sure that we're not even entertaining carnal thoughts. And, and, and you know, let, let's look at this for just a moment. In the Corinthian church, in the letter to the Corinthian church, Paul calls them. He says, you are carnal. Now, he's talking to Christian people, but he says, you are yet carnal. So he understood that, that, that even in the church, there was this element of carnality that had to be dealt with. It had to be recognized, and once it was recognized and brought to the forefront, it had to be repented of so that it can be put under the subjection, under the blood of Christ, under the power of His Spirit, the power of His Word, so that we can be everything that God's called us to be. We, we see this in the American church today. There's carnality in the church. I, and listen, I'm not talking about just Protestant churches, Catholic churches. I'm talking about in the church. You know, all these revelations coming out, all, all these affairs coming out, all these things that are happening, that, that would boggle your mind. I told you not too long ago that, that in, the, in the church of God, just in the church of God, there was, a, there was an anonymous uh, survey given out. And in that anonymous survey that was given to pastors, 60% of the pastors, 60% of the pastors in the church of God acknowledged that they had either viewed pornography or were in a continual viewing of pornography. 60%. And, 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 and it's just an opening of the mind to the breeding ground of carnality. And, 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 and we make light of it. I mean, we, we don't address it. We don't talk about it anymore. You know, growing up, and listen, there's things that I loved about growing up in the church. And there's things that I just, woohoo, just make my skin crawl. But there were some truths that were brought out that if we would just acknowledge that the Word of God declares some things to be wrong, they're wrong. You, you, you can't back down on it. You can't back away from it. There's no sense in making light of it. There's no sense in trying to justify it. The Bible clearly tells us right here in this passage of Scripture that they which do such things shall not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. It doesn't back down from it. It says, listen, if you do these things, you're not going to heaven. Listen, Jesus raised the bar when he came and lived and died for us. 
There, there, there are people that view grace as an out. But, it, but really what happened, Jesus raised the level of expectation of the people of God. Now, now, it's an out in the sense that you get justified from your sin that you repent of, but it is not cheapened to the place that you can live like you want to live and abuse the cross of Christ. So, so he raised the level. I mean, there are people that looked at the, the, the sacrifices of the Old Testament, looked at the, what the prophets and all those folks had to go through, and they think, whoo, good thing Jesus come. He made it easier. Yes, it's easier. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. But the fact is he raised the bar. And so as we as people of God, when we stand before God, we're not just, uh, we're not just breaking a law or commandment, but we are treading on the precious blood of the Lamb of God when we resist him, when we fall away from him, when we get into sin, when we participate in sin, when we play with sin. You are trampling underfoot the precious lamb of God, the blood of God. You are trampling underfoot, and you will stand and find judgment if you do those kinds of things. You can't back away from that, folks. The bar's been set. The standard's been raised. And God's saying to us, listen, this is the place you need to get to. And it's, and it's in me. It, it, it's abiding in me. It's coming up in me. My word's abiding in you, not sinning against me. This is the level I want to get to. And I'm not letting you do this by yourself. I'm going to be with you and get you to this place. I'm going to give you my power, my spirit, the output of the Holy Ghost in your life. And I'm going to help you get to this place and level of living that I've called you to live. But you've got to be willing to acknowledge you can't do it all by yourself. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, he says that, 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 that this gift, this grace is a gift of God. It's not of works lest any man should boast. It's not anything that, that you've done to obtain this love of God. God just loved you. God loved you before there was a you. So, so don't think that you've got to do anything to deserve it. I, I read a very interesting uh, devotion today. One of, I've got about three or four of them I'm doing right now. But I read one interesting, and the guy was talking about how he loves buying gifts for his children. I can relate to that. I, I love giving gifts to my kids or to my wife and, and seeing their eyes light up when they open up the package and see what they've got. You know, I, I love doing that. My, my, we celebrated 20 years in August, and, and I bought my wife a new wedding uh, outfit because, uh, or, or for a ring and stuff, and I, I figured I better do that because for 20 years she'd been wearing my divorced cousin's ring. And it was time to get her something of her own, you know. But uh, I tricked her. So, so we had took the divorce cousin's ring to get it cleaned. And while I was getting it cleaned, I bought the new set for her. And, and, and five more payments, it'll be hers. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I think that's right. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But anyway, I, I gave her, I, I wrapped up, had them wrap up her old set. And, and, and she was like, what are you doing? Because she's, you know, she's not thinking the old set's going to be wrapped up. And they opened up, she goes, oh, okay. That's mine. Thank you, honey. You got it clean. I said, well, here's one more. And, and, and she goes, oh, oh, oh. And she starts crying. And I'm sitting there going, I don't know if this is good or not. Well, later she acknowledged she had a hard time receiving that because she didn't feel, and, and I'm just paraphrasing, okay, but she didn't feel worthy to receive that from me. Until she got to praying and God said, you know, people do me like that all the time. I'm trying to give them good gifts. I'm trying to bless them. And they keep refusing it because they don't feel worthy to, to, to wear that. Or they don't feel worthy to put that on, what, I've, what I'm trying to bless them with. But it ain't about your worth. It's about my love for you. Whoo. And she said, all of a sudden, God just began to inspire her about that. And she put that ring on. She said, look what my husband did for me. Why? Listen, it wasn't about a pride thing. She, and it wasn't about her and her finger and what she had on her finger. It was about the fact that she said, my husband loved me enough that he went and got that for me. Now, I was smart. About three weeks earlier, she had sent me a picture and said, I like this. She was smart because she knew. You know, anyway. <laughs> but it, it, it is not of works. You know, wouldn't it be bad if you give your kids Christmas and then as soon as all the paper's put up and, and, the, and the stuff is being put up in the rooms, they come and say, well, Mom and Dad, what chores have I got to do to earn those gifts? H how would that make you feel? You know, after you went and worked and did all this, now, now some of you might say, praise God, they're going to contribute. No, it's a gift. And you want to give it. You're not looking for anything in return. When it's a gift, 
You know, I didn't expect my wife to give anything in return. You know, I, I just wanted to bless her. She put up with me for 20 years. She, she deserved a gift. Thank y'all for not amening too much. I appreciate that. <laughs> but, but the fact is, she deserved a gift. She, she wore the divorce cousin's ring long enough. It was time to put something on her finger worthy of 20 years of putting up with me. See, that's what God wants to do with us. Not that we've put up with him, but that he's put up with us. And loved us even through our mess and said, I want to give unto you good gifts. And so Paul is encouraging us, listen, these, these things that are going on, these, these shameful sins are not even to be talked about. So Paul warns that some things are not safe even to talk or to joke about. It's a, a grim commentary on human nature that many books, plays, films, TV, movies, they've had success simply because they dealt with forbidden and unpleasant things. That's this, you know, I, I, I loved what happened in the movie theaters over the last few weeks. War Room blew straight out of Compton out the water. And I thank God for that. I mean, you walk into a movie theater and you got a chance to go watch War Room, a movie about prayer, or go watch a movie about a bunch of thugs and gangsters and rappers straight out of Compton. And, and you, you can either go see that movie or War Room, and by a grand margin, people chose War Room. So, so you see, even in that, that there is a hunger in this country, a desire within some people to say, I can't keep going the direction that this world's going. Something's got to change in my life. I even watched a news broadcast of a, of a news broadcaster in California. And that news broadcaster was talking to the Kendrick brothers who put out War Room. And as he began to talk to them, he began to cry. He said, I saw the movie. It's impacted my life. I wanted to run home and clean out a closet and find a place of prayer. I'm talking about a news journalist in a news organization in California, folks, that was weeping on, on television saying, I wanted to go find a place to pray. He said, for 20 minutes in the lobby of the movie theater I was in, they finally had to run us out because people wanted to pray. Listen, if there's anything that can change in this country, and if there's ever been a call that needs to take place in this country, it's a call back to prayer. We are anemic in it, we are dying in it, and we should be coming alive in it. People need to come back and pray. God's still true to His Word. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. I'm telling you, there is a call to go back back to a war room, to go back to a prayer closet and call on the name of the Lord and watch God turn this country upside down. I'm telling you, if God's people will do it, we'll see transformation. And it starts with us, folks. It starts with us. We, we, we got to pray. I know I said a lot, but it, the quote has impacted me. John Wesley said, God does nothing except an answer to prayer. It, it's impacted me. If I want something from God, I've got to pray. If I need answers from God, I've got to pray. I've got to understand the time that we're living in. See, these things, the, the shameful things, the, the sins, the, the unpleasant things, the world is capitalizing on that. And there are people out there that are, that are being drugged to the end and being dropped like a bad habit that are saying, now what? They're turning, you know, I, I, read a, I read an article just the other day of a young lady that's dated a very prominent movie actor. And, and, and she, they found her in her living room last week laying in the floor with his pill bottles laying all around her. She had overdosed and died, committed suicide. Somebody had come to the point that they said, I don't have anything else to live for. It's one of the saddest things that as a pastor I've had to do is go into rooms where people have committed suicide or attempted suicide. It boggles my mind because you're just going into a room with a person that is broken, but a person that is hopeless, a person that doesn't know which way to turn or what to do. But I'm thankful that there are times that people have failed at those opportunities. And I can look at them and say, listen, this is not the end. There's still hope. God is still on the throne. Jesus is still sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he's still able to minister your life. You don't have to go out this way. The devil thought he had you. But God came and grabbed you. And he resurrected you up. And you don't have to live your life without hope. God has given us hope that we can live in this dark world. We can't make light of this stuff. I'm telling you, it's all around us. So, so the, these people have seen success with these forbidden and unpleasant things. Number two, he says that converts must not allow themselves 
in verse 6, must not allow themselves to be deceived with empty words. He said, let no one deceive you with empty words. Now, I, I don't get the pleasure of, 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 of traveling around much and listen to people much, but, but Brother Robbie, if you don't mind me sharing, Brother Robbie and his family have been, uh, if, if you do mind, you can get me out to service. But, but uh, he's been said, he's been, they've been visiting around looking for a church. And he told me, he said, he said, the one thing I appreciate about you is that you, your sermons are chunk full of scripture. I, listen, I don't, I don't know what else to say. I, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, there's times I go back there and, and I put all my stuff on the computer and I try to get it where it can be on the screen for you. And, and, and sometimes I look and there's like 20, 25 slides of Scripture and I'm looking at it thinking to myself, how am I ever going to get through this? And, but but, but I, I, I don't know what else to give you, folks. I don't have a degree for psychological therapy. I, I don't have a, a degree uh, of, of, of sitting you in a room and everybody singing kumbaya and make you feel good about yourself. The only thing that I've ever found hope in, the only thing that I've ever found restoration in, the only place that I've ever found peace was getting in the Word of God and allowing that Word to transform my mind and to renew my thinking so that I can be everything that God's called me to. I'm telling you, friend, the only hope you're going to find is in a Word from the Lord. I'm telling you, there's times that I felt desperate. I felt down in hell. I didn't know which way to turn or what to do but I just went to God and said God can you just give me a word that'll give me something to hold on to that'll give me something to stand on God it might not come to fruition in a time that I think it should but if I've got your word I can hang on to that and cling to that God and know that you'll see me through because I got a promise from you he says converts can't allow themselves to be deceived with these empty words so what does he mean here in that particular time, there were voices in this ancient world, even in the Christian church, which taught people to think lightly of the sin of physical desires. In, in that time, there was a thought called Gnosticism. N not, Gnosticism is, a, is, a, is a, a theological belief that has to do with knowledge. And basically what they said was, is that, the, is that matter is evil and spiritual is good. So... They even took it to the point that they said it didn't matter what you did with your body. As long as your spirit was okay, you were okay, it doesn't matter what you do with the body. That, that's the place they, they took it to. And so these Gnostics, they, they had this line of thought, and, and they began to believe that the spirit alone is good and that what matter, and that matter is evil. So if that's the case, it follows that only the spirit is to be valued and that matter must be utterly despised. So human beings are composed of two parts, body and spirit. Uh, you know, that's a... That's a dichotomous theory. I, I'm, I'm kind of a trichotomous spirit, which means body, soul, and spirit. That's the kind of the belief I have. You know, I believe that you, you're made up of your body, your soul, and your spirit. Your, your soul is your mind, will, and your emotions. That, that's, a, that's a different part about who you are. But, but, but some people believe body and spirit. I believe body. But anyway, I, I, you, basically you got different parts. And so according to this point of view, only the spirit matters. The body is of no importance whatsoever. So therefore, at least some of the Gnostics went on to argue, it does not matter what people do with their bodies. They, they would say it makes no difference if they satisfy their desires to excess. Physical and sexual sin were of no importance because they were of the body and not of the spirit. You know, I, I guess they wrote their own Bible. Because, you know, the, the Bible talks about sinning against one's own body. It talk, you know, it talks about your body as the temple of the Holy Ghost. It, it, it says it's a place where the Spirit of God abides. Think about that for just a moment. This building is not the tabernacle of God. This is the tabernacle of God. This is the place where God dwells. This is the place where the Spirit of God dwells within man. It's in the body. He said that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are a walking sanctuary. Think about that for a moment. Boy, it would, it, it, it would do us well to wake up in the morning and recognize that we are a walking church, a walking sanctuary, a place for God's presence to dwell. I think about that song that we've sung before, and I've heard it, I heard it on the radio just a little while ago. It says, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. I, I, I want to wake up every day of my life with that acknowledgement. God, you are welcome here. I want you to come and dwell with me. Have your way in me, God, every day of my life. So these Gnostics believe that, that, that the bodies didn't matter. So Christianity met this teaching with the contention that body and soul are equally important. God is the creator of both. Jesus Christ forever sanctified human flesh by taking it upon himself. He came here, lived in the flesh, 
And the Bible tells in the book of Hebrews that we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus came in sanctified flesh. And now because of what he did, we can be sanctified. We can be cleansed. We can live holy. Jesus declared, I want you to be holy for I am holy. You know, there, there are people out there to say, well, God understands my sinful nature. He understands it needs to be redeemed. He understands it needs to be cleansed. He understands it needs to be sanctified. You know, I, 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 I had a preacher friend of mine one time. I sat and listened to him preach, and he started talking about how God understood when you sin, how God understood when you participate or play with. And I sat there, and the more he talked about it, the more my skin crawled. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, why are you perverting the, the gospel to a place that people can go out and live like they want to live and do like they want to do and still come in and, and, and think they're going to be all right? No, free. God come to set you free. And he that the Son is set free is free indeed. He, he wants you free from that sinful nature, that sinful lifestyle. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I, might get, I might get meddling here in just a moment. He sanctified it by taking it upon himself. The body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and Christianity is concerned with the salvation of the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. He didn't just come to redeem spirit and let your body fall. Matter of fact, he exhorts us that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our body, with all our mind, with all our strength. This is how you ought to love the Lord. That means I'm going to love him with everything that's about me. Not just, not just what I think, but what I do, how I do it. He didn't give my hands to just wave at the neighbors. He gave my hands that I can lift them in the sanctuary and glorify God and clap them and shout and open up my mouth. He didn't give my, my mouth that I could be a jester or a joker. I, listen, I kid with the best of them, but that's not the purpose why he gave me my mouth. He gave my mouth so that when it opens, it brings glory and majesty and honor to God. I'm to worship him. I am called to a position of worship, a position that's much higher than any other angel or anybody else could ever attain, not because that I'm greater than them, but because I'm redeemed. They don't understand that. I got a song that they can't sing. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Listen, this is what Christ came to do for us. But you can't make light of sin. So, so that was an attack from outside the church. But there's also an attack inside the church. And it's an even more dangerous attack. There were those in the church, and we talked about just for a minute, trying to move on here, who distorted the doctrine of grace. If you look in Romans 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, it's, it tells us in the scriptures there that, that what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that God's grace may abound? He said, God forbid, or certainly not. What, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? But there was this doctrine, and there is this doctrine of grace. I heard a very prominent preacher say one time that he could be in the bed of adultery and the trumpet of God sound, he'd go to heaven. Very prominent TV preacher said that. I, 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 I'm sitting there thinking, what? I, I mean, if you go into Galatians and look at the works of the flesh, fornication and adultery is right at the top of the list, and it says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. How can you stand up and say, I can be in a bed of adultery and still go to heaven? The Bible also says that a man will believe a lie and be damned. And, and that's what some people have done. They've bought into the lie. You know why? Because it's easy. It's easy. So there's this, there's this distortion of grace. And so this is the way the argument goes. And so they say, so, so you say God's grace is the greatest thing in all the world. Yes, I believe that. God's grace is the greatest thing in all the world, right? Can I get an amen? All right. It's the greatest thing in all the world. So, so you say God's grace is wide enough to cover every sin. It can cover every sin. So, so, so then their, their uh, thing that they purport is this. So let's go on sinning. Let's just go on and keep sinning, for God's grace can wipe out every sin. In fact, the more we sin, the more chances God's grace will have to operate. Paul had the same argument then. He, we got the same argument today. Let's just go out there and live like we want to live, because God's grace is sufficient. Absolute foolishness. But that's the world we live in today. Because, you know, you, you know as well as I do, if you do any kind of evangelism, everybody's going to heaven. I mean, you, you go out and try to do any kind of evangelism today, especially in the good old Bible Belt, everybody's going to heaven. You know, I, I, you, you, you're not going to, it's hard to convince them. I, I had a guy 
who was a big follower of, of Calvinistic doctrine, and, 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 and he and I were having a discussion. This was at work, and we, he and I were going back and forth, and, and, and he was talking about how God saved him and God could keep him. And, and I come to him, I say, well, you live this kind of lifestyle, or do you do this? And it was stuff I knew he did. And so I began to talk to him about the stuff I knew he was doing in his life, and I'd bring the Scripture out where the Scripture said it was wrong, and, and, and if you did it, you wouldn't go to heaven. And, and he looked at me, he kept saying, well, if God can save me, God can keep me. And, and I look at him and say, well, you're living in this kind of lifestyle. And so, so, therefore, if you keep doing this, the Bible says you're not going to get it. Well, if God can save me, God can keep me. They finally got about five times of doing that. Then I looked at him and I said, sir, I, I, I hope you're right. Because if you're right, both of us are going to make it. But you better pray to God that I'm wrong. Because if not, you're going to bust hell wide open. I love evangelizing. But let me tell you what I'd rather deal with. I'd rather deal with a card holds, a card, a hold. Cold, hard sinner. A cold, hard sinner that's never talked about the gospel, that realizes the wretchedness of his ways, than to deal with somebody who sat in a Sunday school one time and thought they got all the knowledge they needed, and they're, just because they sat in that Sunday school class, they're going to heaven. For some of those folks, you might as well go beat your head against that pole right there, and you're going to get about as far as you would trying to get them to convert over or get them to realize the error of their ways. I'm telling you, the, the, Bible, the Bible told us these days would come. The love of many would wax cold. There would be deception abounding. We, we'd see many false Christs. We'd see all these things that are taking place in the last day. And we're seeing those things, folks. That's where we need to understand that, number one, we as the people of God can't make light of sin. There is a way. There is a way that we can, we can bring light to sin. There is a way that Christ did it. That, that I, want, I, I really want to craft the way he did it. He had a way of making a person realize they were living in sin without even beating them up about it. And when he got done, something about the compelling love and grace and mercy that he exhibited caused people to repent without him even really saying the word repent. I think about Zacchaeus. I mean, you're talking about a transformation by just a conversation of saying, I'm coming to your house. And all of a sudden, this man is saying, I'm going to give back, and I'm, not, I'm going to give back more than what I took. I mean, that's repentance, folks. I mean, I think about the woman called the act of adultery. Here's this woman broken and poured out, and Jesus never beats her up over it. She recognizes and realizes she's bad. She's not, she's not looking for the acknowledgement of her sin. She's looking for hope to get out of her situation. Jesus says, I'm here, and I'm not condemning you. Go and sin no more. You know, I, it, it astounds me. It astounds me. We had this conversation Sunday. It astounds me sometimes how church folks go after sinners without the acknowledgement and understanding of how God first loved us. Well, I'm telling you, I am thankful that God didn't beat me over the head with a hammer to get me to come to Him. He loved me unto repentance. I was a mess when He found me. I, I can't speak for nobody else in here. But I was a mess. I was religious. I was antagonistic. I was hateful. I, I was selfish, self-centered, egotistical. And some people will say, well, you're still that way a little bit. I might be. But he's working on me. But when he found me, he loved me unto repentance. There was something that could, and some people say, well, I just don't know. He, he made my heart race and my hair stand up and pulled on me and yanked on me. and tried. Listen, I don't care what he had. He did it because he loved you. So we don't make light of sin. Listen, in our home, we got to guard our home. In some cases, it's the only safe haven we're ever going to have. And we got to guard our home to make sure hell doesn't come in. Because I promise you, sin lies at the door. It's waiting to come in. It's, it's waiting to come in and, 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 and do this. So, so we don't keep sinning so that God's grace would abound. So Christianity met this argument by insisting that grace was not only a privilege and a gift, but it's also a responsibility and an obligation. Grace is not only a privilege and a gift, but it's also a responsibility and an obligation. It's true that God's love could and would forgive, but the very fact that God loves us lays on the obligation to live our lives the best that we can. 
to live worthy of that grace. I don't know about you, but I want to be the best example and the best soldier I can be for the kingdom of God and live my life in a manner that's pleasing to the Father. Because one thing I'm longing to hear is, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter to the joy of the Lord. I'm longing to hear that. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. There are days that I'm praying he don't come. There's days I'm praying, come on, God, give me time to get to you so I can talk to you a little bit. Don't come right now because I'm a mess right now. My thinking's a mess. My ways are a mess. God, my, my life is a mess. And I just got to get in your presence, God, so you can take something out of this mess and make something good of it. I, 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 maybe I'm one of three or four that's here. That, that's where I'm at sometimes. But what I found is when I go and throw myself before him, and I lay myself out in all my mess and say, God, this is who I am and this is what I've done. And this is what I've done that's wrong. And I'm acknowledging that before you. I found that when I confess myself before him and confess my sin before him, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Wow, what a God. I don't go around sinning so that I can have that experience. I'd rather have that experience without the sin. But it sure feels good when you know you dropped the ball that you can run to him. And call on his name, and he'll forgive you. But it's not something that you should abuse. So the gravest disservice anyone can do to someone else is to make that person take sin lightly. Paul pleaded with his converse not to be deceived with empty words which remove the horror from the idea of sin. Listen to me. Sin will put you in hell. I will never back down from that. Sin will put you in hell. I watched a video that my wife was playing on her phone this week. She and I were going somewhere, and she popped it on. It was Ray Comfort. If you've not heard of Ray Comfort, uh, this guy's doing uh, tremendous things with street evangelism. And he, he got to talking to, uh, it was a Jehovah Witness. Uh, he got to talking to, and, 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 and just the, the knowledge that this man was going back at Ray Comfort. With. Ray Comfort, I don't think I've ever seen him get stumped until I've seen him in this conversation. It was almost like he had to walk away from it. The, the guy had such an argument going at Ray Comfort, had such an argument about this that Ray just found it. You know, most of the times he's left and people are acknowledging, I'm a sinner, I need Jesus, I need Christ. And, and he, it, they might not accept him right there, but they, they at least acknowledge I'm not what I should be. This guy was toe-to-toe with him. And basically his argument was, is I don't believe in hell, but I do believe in heaven. And Ray would quote scripture to him. He said, well, that's your argument from your viewpoint. I can make the same argument for mine that there is no hell. Folks, we are dealing with a very ignorant generation, but a very intelligent generation. I mean, this guy, Stephen Hawking, that they claim to be so wise and so smart, I mean, he's talking about aliens attacking Earth now. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wonder why they think he's so smart. I, I, I ain't figured that out yet. But they, they say he's a genius. I, I think he's smart. As my daddy used to tell me, he's too smart for his britches. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, that's what my daddy used to tell me all the time. Boy, you're just too smart for your britches. I ain't figured that out yet. My britches ain't never been smart. They have smarted. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? If you old school, you know when your britches get smarted. Yeah. But he used to tell me, I'm too smart for my britches. I wonder if sometimes people in this life are just too smart for their britches. I wonder if church people sometimes are just too smart for their britches. They, 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 they just think they know it all when we ought to just go before God and recognize that he's God and we're not. And I'm at his mercy. And I'm thankful that I'm there. I'm thankful that I'm in, the, I'm in his hand. I'm thankful that, that, that if I mess up, if I stray, if I get off path, that I can run back to him. But it's not something that I willingly should say, okay, God, I'm just going to do what I want to do because I know you'll be waiting on me when I get back there. It doesn't play that way. The Bible talks about we can send away our dare grace. There comes a point that you can come to an end. You know, we, we, we don't need to play with God that way because none of us really know what that is. We're not promised tomorrow. Life is a vapor. Is there one moment going to the next, James said? We don't know. I told you, and I'm going to close right here, but I told you uh, I preached a funeral of two cousins, and both those cousins, one was 17, one was 21, when they died in car accidents. But just days before, they acknowledged that they had the rest of their life, they'd get right another day. And within a matter of four days, they both perished, both in tragic car accidents. We don't know, folks. And, and I'm not sure. I'm not trying to preach you a salvation message tonight because I believe that you love the Lord. I, I really believe that. But I believe tonight that we need to understand and acknowledge from Scripture 
that we need to be very careful. Listen, you might say to me, well, preacher, I'm not doing that stuff. Well, the Bible says don't even let it be named among you. In other words, don't let it, don't let it come in your presence. Don't, don't, allow, don't allow the influence of it to even touch you. You might not be doing it, but I promise you this, if the enemy can tap into your carnality with lustful thoughts, prideful thoughts, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, if he can tap into that, he'll use whatever avenue he can to pique your curiosity. And guess what he knows? He knows if I can just get it piqued, their carnality will do the rest. Because if you're given the opportunity, I had someone argue with me one time. I said, you put two people in the right scenario, in the right moment, the right time, they'll fall. Oh, I just don't believe that. I'm, I'm telling you, if, if, if it's in the right scenario, in the right moment, the right, they'll fall. I don't care how great they think they are. Right scenario, right moment, and the enemy has the right opportunity, he'll take advantage of it, and you'll fall. That's why we need to be aware of our surroundings. I used to tell the young people as a youth pastor, I said, remember PYE, P-Y-E, protect your environment. You got to be very careful who you're around. You got to be very careful who you allow in your circle. You got to be very careful who's in your ear. You got to be very careful who's influencing you. Listen, folks, I get around people all the time that, that want to try to influence me to carnal ways and carnal thoughts. And I'm very quick to try to change the conversation because I know that given the opportunity, I can go that way because I've done it before. And I don't want to go down that road. So I try to switch the conversation very quickly. Trace, I was studying today and the Lord convicted me. Because I used to be very, I, I used to be very uh, uh, easy to, to jump in and make a, a homosexual into windows. Matter of fact, when I was in college, uh, after my freshman year, a buddy of mine, we were so bad to do it that they changed the rules in the, in the student handbook the next year because of our innuendos. And, and, and because we just cut up, just, just thought it was funny. And, 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 and my wife, sometimes I say, you want me to do it or something like that? She said, don't do that. And, and, and God convicted me today and said, son, you, you, you don't even need to acknowledge that. Not that I'm looking to go lay with a hairy leg man. I promise you that. that. That ain't even in the radar, folks. But as I was studying this, and it talked about jesting, and it talked about making, fun, you know, making jokes about things and, and, and coarse jesting these things. You know, sometimes we find these things, but these things are filthy, folks. They're an abomination to God. And we can sit and watch TV shows that make a joke about it. And the homosexuals, they're always the funny people. The preachers are always the idiots. You know I'm right. And we sit and we laugh and woohoo, they, that's so funny. He says, don't, even, don't, don't be this way. Don't let it be named among you. Filthiness, foolish talking, coarse children, they're not fitting, but rather living a life that's a giving of thanks. And that's the life we need to live. We need to be thankful that God saved us from that kind of wretchedness because such were some of us. Amen. God's good. I hope and pray tonight, tonight was a reminder of how gracious and merciful God has been. But not only that as a privilege and a gift, but it's also a responsibility that's on us to live our life according to the Word of God because a true Christian desires to be free from sin, not to sin freely. A true Christian desires to be free from sin, not to sin freely. Amen. Don't you want to live a life pure and holy before Him? I do. Come on, let's stand and we're going to pray. I appreciate you coming out tonight. Man, I pray this word's impacted you tonight. Father, I love you. Thank you so much. You are so gracious, so merciful. We can never thank you enough, God, for how good you've been to us. And I know, Father, these folks have sacrificed their time after long days of work and doing what they've done. God, that they've come out to your house tonight to, to receive from a word. I pray tonight, God, that this word has been revelatory to them, God, that it has opened up their mind and their heart, God, to understand that we cannot play with sin. We cannot, we cannot even have it named among us, God. we got to be very careful about what our eyes see and our ears hear. God, we got to be very careful about that, God. We need to be in tune with you and not the things of this world. Help us, oh God, to be very careful and very guarded, God, that we need to guard our heart for out of it are the issues of life, God. We need to guard our mind and our thoughts and every every vain thought and vain imagination, God, that exhausts itself against you, God, that we would cast it down. Help us, oh God, to live our life according to your plan and your purpose, God. Help us, God, to acknowledge the things that are before us, God, and to see you, God, in every area of our life, God, and to be that walking tabernacle, that walking sanctuary, God, that habitation for your presence, God, to know that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, to live our life in a way, God, that pleases you. Father, I want to be like David. I want to hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. God, help me to live my life pleasing and acceptable to you, Father. You're doing something in us, God. I believe that there is a call on the body of Christ to come back 
There's a call on the body of Christ to acknowledge and live holy and separated. God, not just acknowledge ourselves as religious and not just acknowledge ourselves as churchy, God, but acknowledge ourselves as the sons and daughters of the King. God, that we will live our lives acceptable and pleasing in your sight, God. To be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Not conformed to the world, but transformed. That we may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Help us, O oh God. Bless your people tonight. God, I pray that your face will shine upon them, that your grace will rest on them, God. God, I pray that the God of peace would keep them, overshadow them, and camp your angels about them, O oh God. Help us all to live our life, God, in a way that pleases you and that others might say, listen, I want that life. I want, the, I want to know that Savior, God. Let people, let people just be drawn to us, God. Let it be noise that you're in our house. Let it be noise, God, that you're in our life. So that all that know, God, and all that see that you be lifted up in our life to be drawn unto you. We thank you for that tonight. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. I, I, I find it fitting before we leave. Can we just thank him for grace? Would you just, right where you're at, would you just thank him? If he's been gracious in your life, if he's been merciful in your life, if you've been saved from a life of sin, you, you owe God praise tonight. God, I praise you tonight. I give you glory and honor, Father. Thank you, Jesus. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Thank you, Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I praise your holy name tonight. You're such a good God. We bless your name, Jesus. We worship you. We honor you, God. We magnify your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. To you be the glory and the honor and the praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Shake hands, fellowship with one another. We love you so much.